My name is Trailer Lovern, and as David mentioned earlier, I have a ministry here in the Birmingham area called Route 1520. The 1520 of Route 1520 comes from Luke 1520, the parable of the two sons. And it really showcases what our ministry is about. It's about helping prodigals and elder brothers come to a real understanding of the Father's heart and what grace, the grace that we've just been singing about, is, is really all about. Um, I have the privilege today uh, to introduce Michael. In Farewell to Arms, Ernest Hemingway wrote these words. The world breaks everyone, and afterward, many are strong in the broken places. David alluded to a little bit of my story. Um, this past Friday, Melody and I celebrated six years of being remarried after being divorced for six years because of my struggle. When I was at Sanford many years ago and knew David back then, Never thought that I'd be in a chapel that at that time did not exist, but have heard all about this chapel. And the first time back, we'd be talking about an issue like this and having a ministry like we have. But hopefully with the, the things that you've seen as far as the publications, that you begin to think about this issue not just as the epidemic, and it is an epidemic, but that you'll begin to see it as an opportunity as well, an opportunity for the gospel because I have the privilege week in and week out and so many of these who are here who are with us and part of our ministry of walking with people in those broken places. That when we, when we meet people who life has, has chewed them up and spit them out or life is just not working and they're looking for answers and they're coming to us for answers, we have the opportunity at that moment to offer them the only hope and that is Christ and the amazing love of the Father, that at that moment they don't believe. They, they come to us believing that I have so messed up. Will you please help me earn my way back to a place that maybe God could begin to like me again? And our message at that moment is, you see, you just don't understand. If you're in Christ, he already is smiling. Michael is an ordained minister. He's a spiritual director and also a licensed profess, professional counselor who himself has experienced the restoring touch of God in a deeply broken life and marriage. Having served in ministry for over 25 years, including youth and college ministry, Michael's passion is to connect life's brokenness with the reality of the gospel. In addition to leading retreats and equipping Christian organizations around the world, Michael currently serves as an adjunct professor at Denver Seminary. He has an MA in Biblical Counseling from Colorado Christian University and an MA from the College of Education at the University of Denver. Michael lives with his wife, Julianne, and they have two children and live in Littleton, Colorado. Please join me after we read the scripture in welcoming Michael. If you'll stand, we're going to have the reading of our scripture. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Okay, you can be seated. Welcome, my friend, Michael John Cusick. Thanks, brother. Uh, don't go away, you have my notes. It wouldn't be the first time that happened. <laughs> Robert Jensen is a secular feminist professor of journalism at the University of Texas, Austin, and he has become, for a number of reasons, one of my favorite non-Christian authors. 
uh, he is presumably not a follower of Jesus, not a Christian. And in a woman's magazine, he was being interviewed, and Professor Jensen said these words, Pornography is what the end of the world looks like. Pornography is what the end of the world looks like. He went on to say, by that I don't mean that pornography is going to bring about the end of the world, nor do I mean that of all the social problems we face, pornography is the most threatening. Instead, I mean that pornography encourages men, and I would include women, to abandon empathy, and a world without empathy is a world without hope. Pornography is what the end of the world looks like, said a secular professor of journalism. In 2008, I was in a conference uh, called the Theological and Cultural Thinkers Conference, and Dr. Dallas Willard, one of my personal heroes, was there. And his, his job at this conference was to teach on the kingdom of God. And Dr. Willard, uh, who passed away just a few years ago, you know, was renowned for all of these voluminous works, and it was a scholarly moment that everyone had, had expected to come to, to hear him teach on the kingdom of God. And before he began his formal talk, he said in his voice that sounds exactly like Thurston Howell III from Gilligan's Island, if you would indulge me for a moment, I've written a paper that I would like all of you to consider. And he handed out to all 60 of the attendees uh, a, a paper that he had written on pornography. People were just standing, scratching their heads, going, Dallas Willard is writing about pornography, and we're here on the kingdom of God. What is this about? He said, if the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, which we're exploring over the next three days, cannot speak into and touch this issue, let's all close our notebooks and go home right now. And you could hear a hush in the room. And inside, because this is my line of work, so to speak, I was going, yes, thank you, Dr. Willard. See, the question that Dallas framed in that moment was, can the gospel of Jesus Christ touch the deepest brokenness inside of us? Can the gospel of Jesus Christ actually capture our passions in such a way so that we would like Paul, who said in 2 Corinthians 5.14, it's Christ's love that compels me because I'm convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. I was 16 years old, the year was 1980. I had grown up Roman Catholic. I had basically become a form of an agnostic and I had a very dramatic conversion at age 16 through the ministry of young life. I discovered that, that the Father God loved me, that Jesus forgave me of my sins and I was cleansed. And so just about a month after that time of coming to Jesus, I took the stack of pornographic magazines that was underneath my mattress. No one was home and I went down into the basement of my home, this 1940s bungalow, and we had this metal incinerator where we burned garbage. Today, the Environmental Protection Agency would surely come and confiscate that. But uh, I put all the magazines inside, lit the match, watched them go up in flames. Came back an hour later, there was a pile of ash. Something sincerely, deeply inside of me said, God, thank you. Thank you, I'm free. Thank you that you forgive me. Thank you that this is over, I'm done with it. And I wish that I could tell you today that I was done with it. It wasn't but a few weeks before I was back in the pattern of compulsive lust, pornography, and then from age 16 as a follower of Jesus, who memorized scripture, who went to conferences, who did the Saturday morning 6.30 a.m. super spiritual stud Bible study, who led other people to Christ, who became a youth minister from age 16 to 29, I had a secret life that developed a life of this public self who was this together Christian and this private self that was filled with shame and dread and anxiety and with this core belief that if you really knew me, you wouldn't want anything to do with me. See, the question that I was wrestling with and the question that I could not answer, and it seemed that nobody in my circles of influence, the people that were discipling me, nobody could answer this question. How do you connect this good news, this transformational news, to the deepest part of who we are? And we all have heard statistics, so I won't bore you with statistics today about pornography. I simply say that porn and all that goes with it is like secondhand smoke. So if you are not 
somebody who struggles with lust, pornography, or sexual immorality, please don't tune out because everything I'm saying is relevant because, as scientists have proven, you can die from secondhand smoke. Your spiritual well-being is at stake from the secondhand smoke of pornography. And as I talk today about the pornification of global societies, it really revolves around this question. To what degree can the gospel touch it? And what should we expect from the gospel? I lived a life of quiet desperation as a follower of Jesus, asking this question. Is this as good as it gets? Is this as good as my relationship with Christ gets? Where I'll have days or weeks, or there was one period when I went and worked on summer staff at a camp, and I went for one month without acting out sexually and with pornography, and, and I felt like this spiritual giant. giant. And see, the, the wonderful thing about that was it was a taste of freedom, and the horrible thing about that is that I concluded that God loved me because I went 30 days of having sobriety. Pornography on a global level is no longer about a guy issue. It's now a guy-girl, a male-female, him-her issue. The statistics are now starting to tell us that for women, pornography is becoming as big of a problem as it historically has been for men. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. But before I jump in and offer you four reasons why every missionary, every evangelist, every Christian that wants to make a global, local impact with the gospel of Jesus Christ, why we need to understand that this pervasive Pornography, which seems on one level through the eyes of Robert Jensen, the journalist, that pornography is what the end of the world looks like. Why, in fact, it's actually a bridge to the gospel and to the good news of Jesus. Most of us believe that whatever it is in our life that we're struggling with, that when we clean that up, when we get it out of the way, when we get fixed, that somehow we can be used in the kingdom of God, we can be tight with God, and we can love others. But the reality is the very things that we believe are barriers to knowing God and loving others, when we surrender those to him, they become a bridge to knowing him and loving others. What God wants is our brokenness. There's one thing you must hear today before I share these four reasons why the gospel is a bridge to people knowing Christ and his kingdom coming. And that is, issues with pornography are not about sex. That oftentimes surprises people. Pornography actually has nothing to do with sex except for the images that a person might be looking at. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, and I'm paraphrasing Eugene Peterson in the message, he said, sex is more than mere skin on skin. It's as much spiritual mystery as physical fact. There's something more that's going on in the heart of a human being made in the image of God as they look at pornography. And that something more is the first reason that we need to understand. And that is pornography. Struggles with pornography, lust, sexual immorality are about the heart's search for life. It was G.K. Testerton who said that the man who's knocking on the door of a brothel, he's knocking for God. The man who's knocking on the door of a brothel is knocking for God. I heard that quote over 20 years ago. As I began to write my book, Surfing for God, I started to ask the question, if that's true, then maybe the man or woman surfing the internet for porn is surfing for God. Maybe it's a human heart searching for life. Maybe it's more than just the tip of the iceberg of wickedness. Maybe there's a hunger beneath the surface that's driving it. The gospel is available but we must recognize in the struggle with lust and with the appetites of our heart that what our heart is really searching for is life and life in God. A second reason why pornography is not a barrier but a bridge and an open door to the gospel is because it's about misdirected desire. I'll oftentimes sit with a group of men, sometimes a group of women, sometimes mixed company or a couple, and I'll ask people to talk about the first word or the first sentence that comes to their mind when they hear the word desire and being a follower of Jesus. And people will say things like suppress, kill, manage, deny. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that the pursuit of purity is not about the suppression of lust 
but about the reorientation of our desire. And unfortunately, one of, one of the most Christian, common Christian approaches to dealing with pornography today is to take your desire like a beach ball and push it under the surface of the water and hold it down. And we call that freedom. At best, taking your desire and holding it down underneath the water, at best, it can be sobriety. But it takes a tremendous amount of energy and focus to hold that beach ball under the water, energy and focus that could otherwise be invested in loving God and loving others. And we all know, like I did at the age of 16 when I burned those magazines, what happens when just for a moment you take your energy and your focus off the beach ball. The beach ball pops up with greater force and ferocity than it ever has before. And you find yourself, like I did, wondering if you're even a Christian, wondering if God could love you, wondering why the gospel hasn't set you free. Why have you not been able to connect the broken reality of your life to this good news in Christ? See, we all have deep desires that are gifts from God. We all know the verse in Psalm 37, 4 that says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and what? He will give you the desires of your heart. Our desire is not the problem. It's what we do with the desire. I love the quote from Thomas Aquinas, the 15th century Spanish philosopher and monk, who said that every sinful behavior is rooted in a legitimate, God-given appetite. What would it mean, therefore, if beneath the global obsession with pornography and the pornification of society, what would it mean for believers in humility and exposing their own brokenness? Because as one Christian theologian, the comedian Ken Davis said, the Christian, because of Jesus, has nothing to hide, nothing to prove, nothing to lose. What would it look like if we went to unbelievers and our brothers and sisters and lived with nothing to hide, nothing to prove, and nothing to lose, and we said, I'm struggling? And let's sit down and talk about our hearts. And let's talk about our desires. Oh, wow, you look, at, you look at porn and you don't think there's a problem with it? Rather than just telling them all the reasons why it's wrong, what, what is it that you want from porn? Oh, I don't know, it just makes me feel good. It just, it, just, it just makes me feel comforted. It just makes me feel, and eventually you will get into the person's heart and their God-given longings and appetites. In my book, Surfing for God, I talk about seven core longings and appetites. And if you have that kind of a conversation with a person, you'll hear them talk about their longing for attention in the sense that they matter. Even if it's an image giving the person attention, you'll hear about their longing for affection, for affirmation, for acceptance, for a sense of belonging. See, the lie behind every image is that you matter that you're wanted, that you're desirable. It's the reason why John Eldridge said in his book, Wild at Heart, that the reason why porn is the most addictive thing in the universe is that it makes a man feel like a real man without requiring him to be a real man. I would add the corollary that the reason why porn might be the most addictive thing in the universe for a woman is because it allows her to feel like a real woman without having to be vulnerable. It's about core longings in our heart. Longings that every unbeliever has and longing that every believer has. And as I speak of evangelism and missions, I'm very passionate about saying that we, the body of Christ and the church, need to be evangelized. And I don't mean evangelized in terms of crossing from death to life like John 5.24 says. I don't mean getting saved, but evangelized in terms of hearing more and more and more of the gospel message and the good news. It was Oswald Chambers who said that sanctification becoming more holy, becoming more godly, growing in godliness. Sanctification is simply getting used to and living in justification. We need the gospel as much as those who have never heard the good news. We need it for different reasons. Not to have assurance of heaven, but to have freedom in the present moment and freedom from the compulsions and the things that bind our heart. We are losing the battle <laughs> in the battle for human hearts, whether that of believers who know Jesus or unbelievers. But despite the fact that we're losing the battle, I find myself deeply, deeply encouraged. And that's because of the third reason. The third reason why pornography and sexual struggles are not a barrier to the good news, but a bridge to the good news, is because ultimately, pornography is about the brokenness of the human heart. And I like to speak about brokenness 
with five W's. Wickedness, woundedness, weakness, warfare, and wiring. For those of you that have obsessive compulsive tendencies and you're taking notes, wickedness, woundedness, weakness, warfare, and wiring. If you ask the average Christian, what does it mean that we're broken? People will say, theologically accurate and correct, broken means that we're sinful. And I would agree with them. But there's a context that we need to understand. Because see, when I was 16 years old and I was a new Christian and I was struggling with all of these behaviors and looking at pornography and acting out and I couldn't stop despite praying harder, reading my Bible more, trying harder, the question I was wondering is, like Paul in Romans 7, why am I doing what I don't want to do? Why am I not doing what I want to do? Who can rescue me? How can I connect the reality of this good news to the reality of my brokenness? See, the first W W of wickedness is primarily what we focus on. We are sinners. I have a very strong hamartiology, a theology of sin. Psalm 51 says that I, that we, are sinners from birth, from the time that we're conceived. David was aware of that fact. But there's always a context to why we sin. And to be clear, I'm not saying that we are sinners because of these other W's or these other factors, but the context is like the soil in which our sin grows. And that context is that every one of us are wounded. Our brokenness is not only wickedness, but woundedness, that we've been hurt, that we've been harmed. Some of us have been outright traumatized, and generally those wounds fall into two categories. Wounds of presence, things that never should have been done, or wounds of absence, things that should have been done that are left undone. And for some of us, there's been extreme abuse or neglect or trauma. And for some of us, we grew up in a relatively good home, and the greatest wound that we can think of is not being picked for a playground event. But Jesus himself was wounded, not just on the cross, but growing up as a Jewish boy in that culture. He experienced disappointment. He experienced He experienced a kind of interpersonal loneliness. He experienced pain at the hands of others. And wounds have two issues that we need to understand in relation to pornography. Number one, they actually cause harm to our soul and in certain cases to our physical self, which is what trauma is. But the other issue with wounds and abuse and pain that we experience is it becomes the context in which we wrestle with God and begin to doubt who he really is. And like our ancestors in the Garden of Eden, our wounds become the context in which we are deceived. They were told, did God really say? You will not surely die. Parentheses, I'm not sure, Adam and Eve, that you can really trust him. See, all of our wounds are the place where we ask the question, what is God really like? And if he has my back, then why am I so lonely? And why am I so broken? Or why do I have this pain in my gut? Or why is it so hard to connect with others? Or why do I feel anxiety? It was Oswald uh, Chambers who also said that all sin is rooted in the suspicion that God is not really good. And so out of our wounds, we turn to substances or behaviors or pornography or other sexual acts to become a kind of goodness for us when we're wondering whether we can really trust God. The third W is weakness, wickedness, woundedness, weakness. Weakness is not simply I'm weak and I need Jesus, like Philippians 4.13 tells me, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I need him to strengthen me so I can be stronger, so I can say no. That's not the kind of weakness I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of human weakness where all of us are born in a world where we have limitations and vulnerabilities. Sometimes those are limitations and vulnerabilities about getting our needs met. But those limitations and vulnerabilities look like this. We all come into the world with gifts and talents and strengths. And we present those to the world, but we also have weakness, limitation, shortcoming, whether it's real or perceived. And what most of us do is we take those and we put them behind our back. And we say, you're not going to see that part of me. And so we offer to the world a self that is, as Brennan Manning said, an imposter or a kind of false self. God says, bring your weakness and I'll make my power perfect. Paul said, I boast in my weakness. One time I was asked to consult with a Christian organization on their leadership and helping them develop godliness. And so I I read the verse about 
Paul boasting in his weakness. And I started the meeting by said, let's all go around the circle and let's boast in our weakness. People's jaws drop like, what are you, what, what are you talking about? Yeah, let's, let's fellowship. Let's connect over the basis, not of our strengths and who we want one another to think we are, but who we really are. And see, when we go to pornography, the answer is always, I think you're wonderful. I want you. I will give you what you want. I'll make you feel comfort. I'll make you feel joy. I'll make you feel connection. I'll make you feel power, all without any risk or vulnerability. It overpromises and it underdelivers because it's all based on a lie. And so we need to embrace and know our weaknesses, our limitations, and our vulnerabilities rather than push them away or push them down. Wiring, we are neurological beings, the fourth W. I'm not going to go into wiring, but there's a wonderful non-Christian caveat, non-Christian website called yourbrainonporn.com. And in my book, there's a chapter based on that website called yourbrainonporn.com. And I'll simply say this about wiring. Many Christian men and women wrestle with their spiritual muscles and their spiritual willpower, trying to get Jesus to help us tag team wrestle the problem of lust to the ground, never realizing that it's not really an issue of willpower, that the brain is highly, highly, highly addicted to internet pornography in particular because of a chemical called dopamine and how that rewires the brain. And so very often when a person gets understanding about how our broken wiring and physiology is a part of this problem, it can strip away layers of shame that the enemy uses to keep us captive, not just to the struggle of lust and porn, but captive to shame. And that's the final W, wickedness, weakness, woundedness, wiring, and warfare. The greatest act of warfare with pornography in the world today, with full knowledge that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, as Ephesians 6 tells us, the greatest act of warfare is not temptation. Oh, I saw this attractive man or woman, or I saw this image, or I came across this website. The greatest act of warfare in regard to pornography is deception. Deception about who God is and deception about who we are. The deception about who God is, is he's not good. You can't trust him. You can't be really who you are, naked and unashamed before him as our spiritual ancestors were. You have to try harder. You have to strive. You have to work. You have to show him that you really want this freedom. And then that desire that you show him will somehow turn a lock that you'll be able to walk into this room of grace. But that's not how our father works. That's not the father of Jesus. The deception is always about what God is like. And if we are deceived about what God is like, then we are deceived about who we are. And the first deception is that we are not lovable, that, that, that we're not good. And I don't mean good enough in terms of some standard between us and God, but simply that our worth as image bearers, as being made in the likeness of the triune God, that there's something about us that's flawed, that there's something about us that's deficient. It's a deception and an accusation of shame. And you may have heard this, but the difference between shame and guilt is very important. Guilt says, I've done bad. Shame says, I am bad. Guilt says, I've done wrong. And shame says, I am wrong. And I would suggest to you that the scriptures teach, beginning in Romans 8, 1, that we know that says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The scriptures teach that the Father of Jesus does not shame us. The Father of Jesus is not doing one of these looking at us. The Father of Jesus, despite what I thought, was not looking at me at age 16 saying, Michael, I saved you from the flames of hell and I can't believe you're doing that. His heart is full of compassion and love and mercy. But more than that, the fourth reason why I'm encouraged and why I am deeply, deeply impassioned about bringing a gospel to the world that is obsessed with sexuality, a gospel to the world who has made a god and an idol out of pornography, is because the gospel of the scriptures is a gospel of restoration. For the last several hundred years, there's been a gospel of what Dr. Dallas Willard called a gospel of sin management. And the focus on the gospel of sin management is to get saved so that you can know that you're going to heaven 
and that is absolutely essential and central to fulfilling the Great Commission. But there's so much more to that. Getting saved to know Jesus so that you can go to heaven is just the doorway that we walk through into a gospel of the kingdom and a gospel of restoration. What was Jesus' very first sermon? It says in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus left the desert where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. It says that he was full of the Holy Spirit and he went to his hometown of Nazareth. And he walked into a temple and was handed a scroll. And this was not just Hebrew scripture of the day grab bag where someone reached in and pulled out a scripture and handed it to Jesus. This was the liturgical calendar which had been set up in advance. And so think for a moment of a presidential election, perhaps in a great hall similar to this chapel, but it's just a local temple and Jesus walks in and he is on point. He's going to communicate, this is what the heart of my father is about. Unrolls the scroll and he reads from Isaiah 61. And Isaiah 61 says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up broken hearts and set captives free. Jesus' very first sermon, his first message. Hey, what does this guy stand for? What's he all about? I I don't have time to go into this here, but that passage in Isaiah 61 has this curious, beautiful image that after Jesus reads in Luke 4 from that scroll, and as we turn to Isaiah 61, we see that the promise is that God comes in Jesus and he enters into everything that's broken. And he takes what is captive and he sets it free and he takes what is burned and in ashes and he makes it beautiful and he takes what's mourning and he brings life out of it. And then he says, and I will make you oaks of righteousness to display my splendor. Here's why I'm encouraged on a global level and a local level for the gospel of Jesus Christ. At 16, I was answering the question, or asking the question, how can the gospel and the good news touch the deep brokenness of my heart? Isaiah 61, the promise is that we become oaks of righteousness. I've scratched my head. What is an oak, and why in the world would Isaiah use that image? In Isaiah chapter 1, God speaks of the sexual idolatry of Israel in this way. At the end of chapter 1, he says, you go to the shameful oaks. The oaks were the places where the Canaanite gods of Baal and Asherah and Molech engaged in all kinds of sexual immorality, and the god Molech literally required the sacrifice of children in sexual practices. Fast forward to Isaiah 57. There's this reference again to the oaks. You who go off into the oaks and burn with lust and sacrifice your children to the god Molech. He's putting the image of the oaks in the context of the deepest place of shame and disobedience and idolatry. And along comes our Savior Jesus, the visible image of the invisible God, and he doesn't say in his very first sermon, I'm going to die on a cross so that you can go to heaven, so accept me and uh, see you when we get there. Instead, he preaches a message that is core to the struggle today that says, I have come to bind up your brokenness, to make you whole. I have come to enter into the places where you are captive. And as the psalmist tells us, God does not despise his captive people. And in the place of your greatest shame, in the place of your greatest idolatry, I'm going to enter into that. I'm going to bring life and healing and salvation and rescue. And I am going to, as the psalmist says in Psalm 23, restore your soul and make you an oak, not of shame, not of brokenness, but an oak of righteousness to display my splendor. Thank you.